Hi, I'm Mrs. Bernasconi, and welcome to the Biology Vodcast on Ecosystems. In this vodcast, we're going to be talking about the central concept to ecosystems. And that key idea is the fact that energy flows through an ecosystem. That is, it moves in one direction. We need a constant input of energy in order for life to continue on this planet. On the other hand, we're also going to talk about trophic levels and how matter moves through an ecosystem. Trophic levels are just different levels of the food chain or food web. And matter does something different than energy. Matter recycles. And I say recycles because it really implies that the matter is going round and round and round. Because we can't create, we can't destroy matter. It just changes. So some of the air you're breathing right now once belonged to a dinosaur. And that's the other key idea in ecology and in ecosystems. So let's continue. Energy flow is going to be one way through our ecosystem. Now, where does most of our energy come from? If you remember, I said we need this constant inflow of energy all the time. And on Earth, most of the energy enters our ecosystems through sunlight. Hooray for the sun. If the sun goes out, it's a problem. Now, that sun enter, light enters as solar energy. And unfortunately for you and I, we can't actually use it. We need something to harness that solar energy. Any ideas? That's right, photosynthesis and producers. They're going to harness that solar energy for us. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Only a very small part of the energy that actually enters the Earth's atmosphere from the sun is converted to sugars through photosynthesis, less than 1%. So we constantly need this inflow of energy coming in. That light energy is going to be converted to chemical energy. And chemical energy, you can see here, chemical energy is the energy in the bonds of an atom or of a compound. So the compound we're talking about is glucose, okay? And glucose is a simple sugar that's manufactured through the process of photosynthesis. See if you remember any basic chemistry and what that formula for glucose is. Any ideas? I'll help you out. Glucose is composed of carbon, six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms. This is the basic molecule that's produced through photosynthesis. Okay, let's write out a chemical reaction. If we're talking about photosynthesis, it helps us to understand what's going in and what's coming out. And if we can understand that, we can see and we can start to trace those different elements. We can trace those things through this recycling of the ecosystem. So in order to make sugars, what's going in? Well, first of all, plants need something for the carbon, okay? We know that coming out of photosynthesis, we're getting C6H12O6. Well, where does this carbon come from? What do plants need? They need carbon dioxide. So we're going to put carbon dioxide, CO2. That's going to be one of my reactants. It's going into the chemical reaction. The other thing that plants need, and in fact really all living things need, is water. So we're going to put in H2O, or water, the miracle molecule of life. Add in some sunlight, and we get C6H12O6, which is glucose. And another benefit for you and I, we also get out of this process, oxygen gas. Okay? We know that matter can't be created or destroyed, so we need to balance our equation, and then we'll be all set. Well, if I have six carbons coming out in glucose, then I need to put six carbons going in. So if I put this coefficient of six in front of the CO2, that tells me that six uh, atoms of carbon are going in. To finish balancing the equation, we need six water molecules, and we get out six oxygen molecules. We'll go into the mechanics of balancing equations at a later time. We have to save some fun for those chemistry teachers. But you can see here that how trees and our producers in general and animals or heterotrophs like you and I work is that we're going to take in that glucose and we need oxygen. We use oxygen to break down that glucose and what's the byproduct we give off? That's right, carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide just doesn't accumulate space. It's used by those producers. Producers use the carbon dioxide. They use some water. They give back glucose and oxygen and it goes round and round and round. Energy flow through the ecosystem is one way. Okay, the sugars that are going to be burned, the actual energy that's in those sugars. We're not talking about the atoms now, we're talking about the energy. 
Make sure that you keep those two things straight. The energy that's in those gets burned to run your, the consumer's, metabolism. Your metabolism is how you process that energy and then use it, okay? The atoms stay there, but the energy is getting used. And you use the vast majority of the, of the food you eat every day. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to eat or you're continually putting on the weight of all of that combined food you eat every day. You're burning most of it off. In fact, you're burning off about 90% of it. The remaining small portion, that 10%, goes in to repair your tissues, make things, um, fix different cells, all of that. Okay. When you consume that food and are burning it to do work, some of that energy escapes as heat. Okay? We can change the state of matter of the energy, but it's still moving in one direction. So when you're doing an intense workout, you're producing a lot of heat and you can feel it a lot then, right? A lot of the energy we consume as mammals goes into maintaining our body temperature and that gets radiated out through our skin to the environment. Tragic thing about heat though, once it gets energy gets transformed into heat, you can't reclaim it. You can't soak it back up. You can't harness it again to make it do work in your body. So once your energy gets used and then transfers into heat, it's gone. The only way to get more energy is to take it back in. So again, again, once that energy has been used, it's no longer available for reuse by that organism or by any other organism for that matter. You need this constant input of energy. And that input of energy, again, the bottom line is that it's coming from the sun. In rare cases, it might be coming from some other chemical. We call the harnessing of solar energy photosynthesis. On the other hand, if we're using a form of energy from any other location, we'll call it chemosynthesis. And chemosynthesis is essentially the same idea but now we are using chemicals in order to manufacture the energy. All right, we've talked about one way that energy moves through an ecosystem. Now let's consider the food chain. The food chain is, is serving two purposes again. We're moving matter because when you eat that steak, you're consuming the atoms and the elements inside of it. But the reason, the big reason you're eating that is to get the energy out of those molecules, to consume that energy, to use it for the things your body needs. So the way that the energy really progresses through an ecosystem is through a food chain, okay? And food chains are made up of anywhere from about four to five different trophic levels. Oceanic food chains tend to be a little bit shorter. Terrestrial or land food chains can be a little bit longer. But the one thing that all food chains have in common is that they all have to begin with a producer. The producer is harnessing that solar energy or that chemical energy and making it into a usable form. Another word we give for producers is autotrophs. These autotrophs and producers have the ability to make their own food. So photoautotrophs, okay, use sunlight to make their own food. A couple examples. Can you think of some? Plants, photosynthetic algae, photosynthetic bacteria. These are all examples of producers. Chemoautotrophs, and again, look at the prefix here. Chemo, they're using chemicals to manufacture their own food, inorganic compounds. Okay, um, and some examples of those. We have sulfur bacteria in those deep sea vents, and we'll watch some of those um, great videos that are available of those black smokers, um, ecosystems that exist in the deep sea purely based on the chemicals that are coming up through these rifts in the seafloor. We have over here a real basic food chain, okay? So we start with our producers, okay? And then we have a series of consumers. We have our primary or first level consumers, our secondary consumers, tertiary or a third level consumers, and in some cases we can get all the way up to a fourth level consumer. Okay, As each, we proceed up each level in the food chain, the animals tend to get larger and their energy demands tend to get more and more. And we can remember here, energy flows, so we're moving from those producers to the first level consumer, second and third and fourth and so on. Another term we might use to describe these consumers is heterotroph. So consumers are these heterotrophs. They have to get all of their nutrients by consuming other organisms. They're not so fortunate that they can go soak up some solar rays and uh, get a full belly in the process. They have to eat other organisms. Primary consumers are the only ones that are eating our producers. If you eat producers, you are considered a primary consumer. 
Another way for something that only eats producers, another word to describe it, is herbivore. Okay, an herbivore eats only those producers. Herbivores eat producers, they're plant eaters. Secondary consumers are eating the primary consumers. Okay, sometimes the producers as well. So if they're eating just the primary consumers, we're gonna call them carnivores. Okay, if they eat and consume from both these levels, so if this mouse here eats not only the cricket, but also eats the plant, we'd consider it an omnivore, something that consumes both um, meat and plant material. Okay, ah, last but not least, the great equalizer, fungi. What happens to all this material? It goes up and up and up, but eventually it has to get decomposed. And the great equalizer that consumes all things, no matter how high or how low you are on the food chain, are our decomposers. And fungi like this one here are a great example of a decomposer. So this mushroom, which is the reproductive part of the fungus, actually has all these hyphae extended down here into this rotting log. All these little tendrils coming off of all of these mushrooms. And these hyphae are penetrating into the log and they're digesting it and breaking it down. And eventually, given enough time, all of these materials will get broken down and return into the soil. That's why we say soil is both biotic and abiotic, because the biotic part is coming from these decomposers, chomping all, up, all this stuff and returning it to the soil. Without decomposers, all this dead material will just accumulate and accumulate and accumulate in the planet. So these are um, a really, really important part of the food chain, and they're able to consume on all levels. Okay. Decomposers, they're getting their energy by breaking down dead or um, dying mad or inorganic into inorganic compounds. So our decomposers, fungi and bacteria are both great examples of these. Again, what happens next? Pause the video here, take a second to think about what you've heard, and see if you can answer this in your own words, that what happens to the compounds in the soil next? Where do they go after the decomposer breaks them back down? If you're having trouble, go back to that main idea, the energy flows, but the matter recycles. See if you can fill that in, in your own words. Thought I'd just show you this. It's really very simple, of course. This is a simplified food web in the ocean. So um, you're gonna see that when we talk about food webs in class or when you see a diagram in your textbook or online, they're gonna be pretty simplified food webs, meaning that you're gonna show just a couple um, connections between them. But what a tangled web we weave. The world is actually so much more complicated than, um, than we make it out to seem. And all of the organisms, all life on this planet is really much more intimately connected than we previously thought. So you can see here that um, this simplified food web of the Northwest Atlantic, what's central to it is the cod right here in the middle. And look at how many different organisms are all connected to that cod. It's really quite impressive. Ah, but here's something that's maybe a little bit more manageable for us. Here's a, a really simplified food web showing the interconnections. Now, food web is just two or more food chains showing how they're connected together, and it's a much more realistic view of the world, right? You don't just eat one type of, of food. You eat lots of different types of foods. And so in that sense, a web shows all of the connections and the interrelationships in an ecosystem compared to a food chain which shows just one path. Now, Depending on the path you follow, an organism might be considered a primary consumer or even a secondary consumer. So let's do a little bit of practice with this. So in this picture here, it says at what trophic level um, is the cricket that eats the plants? So let's follow this food web for a minute. Our plants here are our producers. Then if I'm going to the um, cricket, which eats the plants, if I follow my path, the cricket is the first stop on this food chain. So the cricket is a primary or a first level consumer. The next question is which level is the mouse which eats the plants and the cricket? All right, well, here's my mouse. If I'm talking about the mouse that eats the cricket, well, let's follow the food chain. First, we have our producers. Then we have our cricket, which is a first level. If the mouse eats the cricket then, it becomes a secondary level consumer. However, 
if the mouse eats just the plants, we follow this other path, the mouse is a primary or first level consumer. So if you're trying to answer a question like this, really look at the path through which the energy flows. And that's going to give you some important information about the different organism and you're trying to figure out its role and its place in this ecosystem. Again, we talked about aquatic food webs usually have fewer um, steps on the food chain. Here's another great example. I would pause the video here, take a look at this picture, and take some practice. See, can you draw out a couple different food chains? Can you list some of the producers, some of the consumers? Practice with this picture a little bit so that you can become really comfortable with this material. Last but not least, the final thing I want to mention in here is that food webs and trophic levels, are the organisms that live in these, are really more connected um, than we might think at first glance. And you can have both positive and negative interactions going on in a food web. A negative interaction um, having a, a reduction on the population like predator and prey, right? Predators are going to have a direct negative effect on their prey. Well, what's that mean? Well, the predator is going to eat the prey. In this case here, we have this, um, this beautiful lynx, which is chasing a snowshoe hare. That predator has a negative effect on the prey because it's consuming that prey. Upper-level carnivores can have indirect positive effects, though, on producers. Let, let's take a look at this. And I suggest that you draw this out and throw it into your notes. I'm going to talk about a food chain that exists in the Pacific Ocean. And in the Pacific Ocean, Pacific uh, on the coast of California is famous for their kelp beds. They have these giant, giant fronds of kelp which make up an entire forest. And kelp is photosynthetic and it is then a producer, so it's at that bottom level. And feeding on that kelp, we have sea urchins. Notice that I have the arrow in my food chain pointing to the organism that's doing the eating. We're following the flow of energy through here. Sea urchins are eaten by sea otters. Now, from looking at this picture, you think, well, sea otters obviously have effect on sea urchins, but what effect could they possibly have on the kelp? they have an indirect effect on that producer, that kelp. Let's see how that plays out. If I have a sea otter and the sea otters are eating my sea urchins, what does that do to the number of sea urchins that I have? Is it going to increase my population of sea urchins or is it going to drive them down? Well, if you're getting eaten, it's going to lower the population. It lowers the population. Now, if I have fewer sea urchins, are they going to eat more kelp or less kelp? The answer is they're going to eat less kelp. And if they're eating less kelp, that means there's more surviving. So the kelp is going to increase in this population. There's going to be more of it. So lots of times, if we manipulate those upper levels of a food chain, it can have effects all the way down. So it's important if we're considering how we manage a fishery or how many white-tailed deer we take out of a population here in New Hampshire, it's important to consider the effects not just on that one population, but on the upper levels and the lower trophic levels of that food web. Hope you found this helpful. Keep exploring, and I'll see you next time.